Okay. So hello, everyone. The event this evening is being presented by the San Jose State University Special Library Association Student Chapter. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Michelle G, and I am the Assistant Programming Director of SLAS. Thank you to April Pantel and Aisha Abdul Rahman on the programming team, along with the greater SLASC team for helping make this event possible. We would like to begin this event by recognizing that while we gather virtually, San Jose State University is located on the ethno-historic tribal territory of the Thamian Ohlone, who were the direct ancestors of the lineages enrolled in the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and who were missionized into Mission Santa Clara, San Jose, and Dolores. The lands on which San Jose State University is established was and continues to be of significance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. We also recognize that the ancestors of the Muwekma Ohlone constructed and maintained three Bay Area missions. This spring, we have curated a diverse series of events dedicated to engaging active members in the library and information science community who are interested in working in special libraries and would like to learn more about the various opportunities, careers, and roles available in non-academic or public libraries. We have asked professionals with practical experience about their careers, how they came into their current role, obstacles they may have faced, and what advice they would give to those new to the information profession. So tonight's um, event will be interview style. If you have any questions, like April said, you can type them into the chat and we'll either answer them as we go or at the end of the hour. Um, and so now is the time of the night where I'd like to introduce our speaker, Amanda Thompson. And uh, we'll just dive into our first question. So welcome, Amanda. Wonderful, thank you, Michelle. Thank you for inviting me today. You're very welcome. Thank you for being here. So since graduating from San Jose State University with your MLIS, can you give us an overview of your professional experience that led to where you are today? Sure, absolutely. So, well, I would like to start at the very beginning. I have worked in public libraries my entire life prior to even earning my MLIS. It was um, a job that I did in high school and again in college while I was earning my bachelor's degree. So when I found myself working in a library again, after having children and having some time off at work, that was the moment I decided to go to San Jose State and earn my MLIS. Um, it seemed like all the signs are pointing in that direction. Um, and so while I was there, I decided to pick up an internship and I wanted to take an internship that was outside of the scope of the public library because I knew I was very hireable in public libraries, but I wanted to be hireable everywhere. So the first internship that I did was with the Army Research Technical Library. And I will admit to you, this is not a space I knew anything about. This was just something random that I dove right on in. It seemed interesting. It seemed something outside of the scope of what I was used to. And I had no idea what a research library, much less an Army Research Library, would be doing. Um, that internship was amazing. We put together a lot of resources for scientists. They actually used our resources and put together international collaborations through the work that we did. Um, so I was able to see that my job as a librarian can still be very impactful and it doesn't have to be in a public library. In fact, you can actually see the impact that you're making a little bit better in the research library. Um, so I was really intrigued by that and decided that was the path that I wanted to continue to go down. So during my final semester of San Jose State, there was a job opening at the Sandia Technical Library in Livermore, California. Um, I applied to the job and I got it. I worked there for five years. Um, when I first started, there were two librarians. Uh, the second librarian quit within a few months of my working there. So most of the five years I was on my own. And I was kind of a jack of all trades. We did everything from collection development, research, reference questions, trainings, everything that a librarian does, we got, I was able to touch on a little bit. So that was a lot of fun. Um, so I did that for a good five years and I started to look for other jobs mainly because there wasn't a lot of opportunity to growth at Sandia. Um, Sandia has a library in Livermore, but then another one in Albuquerque. So the only way for me to grow was to move to Albuquerque. And then the sciences at Sandia focused on engineering and national security. And again, those opportunities to grow just weren't available had I stayed here in California. 
Um, so I started to look for jobs in other types of libraries and was able to get into Altogenics Pharmaceutical, which is where I work today. And again, I'm the solo librarian doing a little bit of everything for everybody. Awesome. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about that current role as a health sciences librarian at Ultragenics? What does the day to day look like? Oh, wow. So I don't have, <laughs> I don't have a typical day to day ever in my job, which is part of why I love it so much. Um, I can have very dull days where I look at my usage metrics and I tinker with the library's internal SharePoint page. Um, and then I have very, very busy days when we are answering very, very busy, um, important questions. And so we are a pharmaceutical company that focuses on drugs for rare disease patients. And part of making drugs for rare disease patients includes working a lot with federal regulatory agencies, both in the United States and internationally. Um, and the process starts when a drug is for, when somebody first has an idea and they say, hey, we're going to develop this drug. You have to actually apply to the FDA and say, hey, we want to do this, make this drug and we want to run clinical trials. So there's a lot of background information that needs to happen um, and information that needs to go into that. And then as the clinical trials are going on, the FDA might have a question, or, you know, for example, they don't like the dosage that we picked for a patient and they want us to, they want to know why we picked that. They'll come back to me, I'll have to find the literature that we use to make those, those decisions. Um, so we get a lot of those questions. We have a lot of questions regarding copyright. I hold the copyright license for the entire company so that we can share information within the company, but then also with out, outside of the company. Mm -hmm. uh, we have collaborators that we work with, so I make sure that those collaborators are working with us. And then when the questions come up, we try to hunt down what the answer is for that. Um, what other kind of questions we get sometimes. So we do our focus mainly on R&D, mainly on the drugs and the biologies, but we also get in questions say for our investors or we'll get a question from a doctor. Say we had a question from a doctor in Brazil who wanted to use one of our therapeutics on a patient that had a completely different disease. And there's, a, an, again, like another bureaucratic process that has to go through that, but we provide the background information so that they can go ahead and proceed and then that patient can have that therapeutic. Wow, it sounds like you are quite busy. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are always busy. Not, not any day sounds the same. Um, so did your MLIS prepare you with these skills needed to be successful in these roles? And if so, were there any specific classes that best equipped you? Oh, so I always think this is a tough question because on one hand, the MLIS did prepare me, but I don't think the MLIS by itself fully prepared me. Mm -hmm. So you definitely have to have the piece of paper, although I will admit sometimes in companies, you can massage that a little bit sooner if you're going into the private, um, private business world. Um, but typically you do need to have the piece of paper. Um, and there were a fair amount of classes that I thought um, really helped me out. I think in the beginning, the information retrieval class where we had to build a database, and then I did another database class um, where we use SQL to build a relational database. And those two classes helped me out really well because it helped me see how people think about information and how other people categorize information. So when I'm dealing with a question and I'm trying to figure out, you know, what keywords to use, I often reflect on those classes um, and try to figure out how the information is layered. I really like, I don't know if Howard Dean is still there, but Howard Dean used to teach a web design class. Um, I know web design might not be a thing right now, but it does help me facilitate our internal SharePoint safe, um, mm. site. A lot of companies have content management systems like SharePoint. Um, I don't find that they offer all the tools that I want. So being able to have web design skills in the background to make it how I want has been really helpful. Um, and as much as I don't want to say it, the cataloging class is actually very helpful too. Even though in a medical library, I don't work with mesh records nearly as much, or sorry, I don't work with the MARC records pretty much at all in this position. We work with mesh records. It still helps me see how that, how that works mm -hmm. and how categorizing, uh, categorizing information works. 
had I known that I was going to go down this route, I would have taken classes, say, in the mesh controlled vocabulary, or if they had a class in systematic reviews, which are these really highly curated literature reviews that librarians do, and they actually get authorship for it. Um, and I didn't know that medical libraries did that until I came into this space. Um, but that's something I wish I would have had a lot more practice in. Mm, interesting. Thank you. Um, what professional experience has best equipped you for your career in special libraries? So honestly, I think working in public libraries actually helped me um, with my career. And I say that because, yeah, the, the people you're working with are slightly different, right? Public library, you get all walks of life in there and in the company, you only get the company people, but you still get a wide variety of questions. You still get a wide variety of personalities you have to deal with. Um, and it helped me view the library more as a community space and not just this thing that I own and here it is. Um, some librarians in our space, it's a critique that I have of librarians in our space sometimes can be very, um, particular, they really want to come off as professional, which is great. And I love that. But sometimes I feel like they lose their heart a little bit in understanding really what the library service encompasses. And I don't ever want to lose that. And I think part of the reason I've been effective at both Sandia and here at Altergenics is trying to bring in more of that community, that community feel that this is a resource for everybody. I love that. Yeah, it doesn't lose that when you when you transfer to the corporate space. Yeah. As a professional who has switched fields from engineering to the pharmaceutical industry, what can you say about being an effective librarian in a field where you are not a subject matter expert? <laughs> so I've never been a subject matter expert in any library that I have worked in, either at Sandia or at Eldergenics, at least when I first started. So what I learned specifically at Sandia and you know really starting from the public library realm too was how to ask a question and not being afraid to ask a question so you know what gets intimidating about the, both of these jobs is that you're working with people that have these really fancy degrees they have their MDs they have their PhDs um, you know at Sandia we had people at the top of their field in engineering sought after throughout the world and they're asking me a question mm -hmm. um, what I would, how I approached that when I first got there was really sitting down with all of our researchers and trying to understand what they were doing. People love to talk about the work that they're doing, especially when it's their life work. So I would take, sit down with them, take notes on what they were talking about, and then go back and ask questions. So for example, at Sandia, there was a type of steel that they were studying. Well, why are they studying this steel? They're studying the steel because they want to convert our natural gas pipelines into potentially using them as hydrogen, as part of the hydrogen infrastructure. Um, so going back, um, this is going back to, um, you know, thinking about changes that we're making in the world. So they want to potentially use the natural gas pipelines for hydrogen pipelines as we go into the future. Um, hydro um, hydrogen corrodes metal pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, pretty fastly. So there's a particular type of steel that they were researching to try to convert the pipelines over so that we can potentially have a hydrogen infrastructure. So that was something, you know, I had to go back and ask the hows and the whys, and then specifically the name for the steel. Um, I don't remember the official name for the steel, but it had a number, 304L. So then when I was searching, I could know how to put both of those keywords in and get exactly the information that they are looking for. And so that's something I've had to bring back, of course, at Altergenics. I don't know anything about biology or gene therapy. We do a lot of gene therapies, or at least I didn't when I started. But I was able to ask those questions, sit down with people and say, OK, so we are studying this. What does that even mean? And here are some acronyms I found. Do these acronyms make sense to you? So for example, we have a disease we study. We call it TIO. TIO can mean any number of things. If you go into PubMed and search TIO, you're going to find information for tumor-induced osteomalacia, which is a disease we do study, or you will find information for um, titanium oxide, which is completely useless for us. So really understanding those differences and knowing how to ask those kind of questions. And the best part about being this 
in a special library is you might not know for that first year, but after that first year, you become kind of established and you know what your company wants. So you can actually anticipate then what they're going to ask and what their needs are. And so when you see the same repeat patron come to you multiple times, you know where they're going with their question. Wow, yeah, that is, um, that's a big learning curve, but you make it somehow yeah. sound um, <laughs> like, like it's possible. So thank you for it, explaining that. It is 100% possible. It really truly is. I feel like that is um, something that we need to work on as special librarians is letting people know that it is possible. So much of this, you're not going to learn until you are in the job itself. Right, right. Yeah. So how and why did you decide this specific career pathway? So um, as I had mentioned earlier, it was started with an internship that I took when I was a student in San Jose State. And if I'm going to be completely blunt, a lot of it has to do with wanting to make a difference, but also wanting to be able to pay my bills. Um, we all know public libraries, again, I don't mean to dog on them. I love them. I am in a public library at least twice a week. Um, but here in Marin County, California, the starting pay doesn't cover my rent. In fact, managers pay in these libraries and doesn't cover the rent where we live. And I have two kids that I need to support and special libraries pay better. So that was a large, um, a large factor. But I also can't sell my soul. I really do have to work for something where I know that I'm making a difference and I know that I'm making the world a little bit better. You know, we had that at Sandia. Um, we had a lot of things that we did there. So, you know, back to the hydrogen in the San Francisco Bay right now, the red and white fleet is running on hydrogen power. That it was a project that I helped work on at Sandia. So knowing that wow. that, yeah, right? <laughs> I mean, how do you That's know? really cool, yeah. Love yeah. a job that does that, you know? And then we get that here at Eldergenics too. We get patients because they're rare disease, they don't have any help. They don't have any therapeutics. We're working on diseases that don't have any, any cure or anything solvable. So to be able to make patients' lives better is just something that I can't trade. You know, and I also have to say that I'm lucky enough to have work at a company that also cares about health equity. So that's something that like we've rolled into all of our investigations as well so that we can make sure that everybody has access to the drugs that they need. Um, I, I couldn't work a job where we didn't do something like that. Yeah, that's, that's really important. And, um, I, I just love that, you know, I also came from the public library and to know that you can still make a difference outside of that, um, realm is really good to hear. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I wish they got paid more. I 100% don't think that librarians in the public space aren't getting paid what they're worth. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So to the audience, to those in the audience who may be interested in pr pursuing a similar career path, what skills can you recommend developing to be a prepared candidate? Definitely hone your search skills. That's going to be important and your critical thinking skills and your writing skills because people will ask you to write things up. I, without a doubt, encourage everybody to do one, two, as many internships as you can possibly do, because what people want to know is that you can actually use the tools that you need to use in a very practical sense. So I always recommend doing that. Um, as you go along, I also recommend go through job descriptions. Just search out special, well, special librarians wouldn't be a, a great keyword, but on the special library site, search out all the jobs and look at the descriptions of what they're asking people to do and then take classes and take internships that are relevant to those descriptions. So if it sounds like something you want to do, go ahead and do that. Um, yeah, those would be the big things that I would absolutely recommend. That's recommend that great suggestions. Um, oh, and one more thing. Look outside of being a librarian. A lot of these jobs have alternative titles. So you can be an informationist, an information scientist, a knowledge manager, content manager. Um, different spaces call it different things. I think a previous librarian to me here was an information architect. Mm -hmm. um, so look beyond the keywords or look beyond the traditional librarian term. There's a lot more out there if you actually read the descriptions versus just being stuck on what the title is. 
That's really good to know. Okay, great. How has this job made you step outside of your comfort zone? Oh man, that's every day. <laughs> that's every day, just given the nature of the, uh, the types of people that I work with and wanting to be able to make accurate and informed decisions because, you know, and sometimes those decisions that they make off of information I give them have a company wide and a worldwide impact. And that can be really very, very intimidating. Um, so it makes me step out of my comfort zone pretty much every day. Every day gets a little bit more intense. Every day gets a little bit more crazy. Um, I still wouldn't trade it for the world. Yeah. Wow, yeah. Um, and do, do you feel like as time has gone by in this job, you feel like it's getting, you feel more confident in your role? Mm. That's a yes and a no. Um, I feel like it's a yes as far as at least having a nice baseline of people who know how to use our tools and people who know how to reach out to me and ask me ask me questions so I can find the right answer for them. But to be honest, also as I've grown, it's garnered more attention from people mm. that have more power when it comes to decision making. And so that is where it can be a little bit more intimidating. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. As someone who works as the sole librarian in a large company, how do you access support and advice when dealing with issues specific to library science? So when I started at Sandia, I, Sandia was under the Department of Energy and the Department of Energy has 17 laboratories across the nation. So we had our own library consortium. Um, a lot of those libraries are able to join with things like SLA or, or ALA, but they were not, but us at Sandia were not. Um, so we could only rely on the DOE consortium. And it was actually really great. We got together once a year and we each lab would take turns hosting. So you got to see the other labs and see what their specialties were. And, you know, we exchanged emails. We all get presentations on metrics and what our issues were. And that way we could talk out talk out how we we're going to solve the various issues, you know, what, what is one library doing versus another and come up with really great solutions. Um, here at Althrogenics, when I started in 2020, I immediately joined the MLA, the Medical Library Association, which is a great organization, um, but it's not so great for those of us that are in private industry. It is 100% excellent for those that are in academia or working in hospital libraries. I am really impressed with how, just how active they are and the resources that they have available. Um, it wasn't a good fit for private industry. It did, um, I was able to have a mentor through MLA who also worked in private industry, but she went back to academia. It's just what they're more geared for. So this year I joined SLA and I have to say just having the message board available so far has been extremely helpful. I also have probably one of the best managers in the world and her secret job is to be a librarian. So she really understands things that are specific to library science. So I'm able to talk with her about things as well. Well, that, that is very helpful. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So how do you see your role as a librarian influencing change within your organization? Well, see, we're the keepers of the information, right? And we're the keepers of good information and we're the keepers of accurate information, which are very, very powerful tools and things to have. Um, so by having those tools, we can really influence the change in the outcome. So at Altergenics, we do that by you know providing great information for various regulatory filings. So, you know, whether a drug gets approved or not, the library has a, a role in that, which is a pretty big change that we could make. Um, when I worked at Sandia, we, when I started at Sandia, we were under President Obama. And usually politics don't matter a bit in the federal agencies. They are designed to just keep going no matter what. But when we changed from uh, President Obama to President Trump, uh, one of the policies that Donald Trump had was to refuse funding on scientists that were working on anything related to global warming. Now, 
a lot of the research we did at Sandia was related to global warming, even though it may have been through a national security lens, it still had to do with global warming. So I actually had the opportunity to sit down with scientists and go, they had to go through all their research, anything that said anything about global warming, they would lose their funding. And we're talking years of research and they're just thrown out the window over this one particular phrase, global warming. Um, and these people couldn't lose their money, right? Or their jobs, you know, they have families that they're supporting on this work and the change that they are making. So we were able to sit down and have conversations and really scratch our heads to try to figure out what word are we going to use or what phrase are we going to use instead of global warming in all the research. Um, we did finally come up with a solution. The phrase is global change, which is ridiculous and doesn't accurately describe anything, but it was the only phrase that we could come up with that would allow them to still keep their research and keep their funding going. So to be able to be part of that again and to influence that change was just amazing. Wow, yeah, you see real tangible impact. That's, yeah. That's very cool. So we reached the end of my scripted questions, but um, if anyone that's here in the audience have any questions for Amanda, you can either unmute yourself or put some questions in the chat. Um, I know we have some extra time, so we'd be happy to address any of them. All right, how many internships did I complete? So I completed two internships. Um, at that time, it was, uh, 2013, 2014, when I was doing my internships, um, San Jose State was really great about promoting remote work and the rest of the world was not. So when I did my internship for the Army Research Technical Library, that was a remote internship. And I was really worried that if somebody saw that, they wouldn't think that that had enough value. So I wanted to do an in-person internship as well. So I did um, intern at UC Berkeley for a semester in their environmental design library. And we worked on um, research guides and updating their research guides. They were moving, that was when LibGuides 2.0 was in its debut. So we had it in beta testing. So I got to take part of that as well. So a question from um, Talisha in the chat, what are the pros and cons of solo librarianship versus working in a setting with fellow librarians? Oh, I think that's an excellent question because I think about it all the time. Um, the pro, and it's probably a pro because I've been doing it so long, is that, you know, I get to set the pace and, you know, do what I want, so to speak. I have to do my job, of course, but I don't have somebody hovering over my shoulder telling me how I have to do it, when it has to be done. I just go ahead and do it and I get it done. Um, I also have the authority and the power, so to speak, to make decisions that need to happen. Um, I do have a library board, so I don't necessarily unilaterally just make decisions. If there's something related to content, I will bring it back to our library board and say, hey, is this you know, a product that we need to have or is this a product we can discontinue? We're having an issue with our budget. Um, what I feel like I'm missing out of from not having a librarian, specifically a more senior librarian, I feel like I could, um, I think, tighten up how I do things a little bit. For example, how I approach my literature searches. I think I've had to figure all that out on my own. So maybe having the guidance of someone older and wiser, someone that knows more shortcuts would be extremely helpful. There's a learning curve that happens. And I feel like having another person there would, would cut that out. Yeah, that makes sense. Having someone to bounce questions off of. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question in the chat is, uh, do you have multiple master's degrees? How important do you think it is to have more than one master's degree? Ooh, that is also an excellent question. So I don't have multiple. I only have my MLIS. In the pharmacy industry, to be honest, they would have preferred I had another one. Um, and the reason for that is because they would like me to summarize the information a lot more than I do right now. So they would love it if I had a master's degree, particularly in some sort of hard science. So, you know, and I think it's that way with law libraries as well. Um, you know, I did manage to apply and get a, lot, a law library job. I didn't take it. Um, I stuck with altergenics, but they do often require you to have a JD as mm -hmm. well. Um, but I don't want, it's not impossible to get a job without two master's degrees. Yeah. 
Okay, well, that's that's good to know, and I'm sure to the relief of many people in the audience. <laughs> Um, okay, do you work in a physical library with in-person traffic or do you meet with people remotely? Um, so at Sandia, we had a physical library. We had about 10,000 books, um, a lot of old monographs and engineering. Um, and then we had a classified library as well. So definitely we had in-person traffic. Um, although we had a self-checkout system for the non-classified library, so people could come and get what they want without me having to necessarily be there. At Altergenics, we don't have a physical library at all. It is 100% digital. Um, because I live close to the office, I do go in two days a week now, but it is absolutely not a requirement for me to do that. There is no need for me to go. We have an international team. I have you know, patrons in Japan, Brazil, Turkey, I don't need to be in an office to talk to them. Okay, one more question here in the chat. In terms of trying to get internships for an institution that specializes in topics you maybe aren't specialized in, mm -hmm. what types of things do you put in something like a cover letter in order to have a better chance of potentially getting an interview? Find something related find something related. So for example, in going from Sandia to Altergenics, um, Sandia had biosciences, but it was in national security, so not necessarily the hard sciences. But we did do searches in PubMed, which was on mm. the job description. So I just you know, wrote in there that I knew how to use PubMed because I did. So that's another thing too I really want to make clear. If you know something, say you know it. Don't say you kind of know it. You maybe know it. Oh, I kind of, you know, I took a class in JavaScript and I kind of know it. No, don't go there. Just, you know it. That's what we want to know. Unless the job description said that you need to be an expert, just say you know it 100%. But I definitely read the job description and then figure out what things you have in your life that match up with that and put that in there. That's great advice. What was the most indispensable competence you had that made the difference in your career? Oh boy, that's a good one. <laughs> I just have an uncanny ability to find information and not just here. Like my family has me search out stuff that's just plain old weird sometimes because I just know how to find stuff. Um, and I really don't know where that came from. Well, yeah, I mean, that, yeah. that <laughs> I can see how that would come in handy as a librarian. Very much comes in handy. How did you find your special library's job? What was your job search process like? Oh, so during my final semester at San Jose State, for one, I was just applying to everything, even though a lot of job descriptions say you don't count unless you actually have your MLIS in hand. Um, I went ahead and applied to pretty much everything and anything. Anyway, I did a lot of searching on Indeed and then the Special Library Association site as well. Um, in times that I was feeling desperate, I would go to, there's uh, the Baynet that sometimes has things that are listed on there, but not in any other places. And then to some of the specialty organizations like the Northern California Law Library Association. So I could look specifically here for jobs in law libraries. So I'll go to the real specialized places, but primarily Indeed and the Special Library Association's job search. And can you remind us one more time, what were the job titles you had mentioned to search for? Okay, so let's search for, well, librarian, um, informationist, information scientist, oh, information specialist also works, information specialist, um, knowledge manager, content manager, information architect. Um, there was a woman named Naomi House that used to have a site called I Need a Library Job. I'm not sure she's still doing that anymore. I have actually been on that site, yeah. I think okay. it's she, yeah, there's a whole list of synonyms that you can use. That, that you have listed out. That's actually the list that I went to to pull out job titles to go through. Oh, okay. And then also read the job description because content management doesn't always mean something similar to librarian, but sometimes it does. Mm -hmm. um, or sometimes you search out engineering librarian and you'll get 
this weird techie ECAT librarian that has nothing to do with anything that, that we do. I have seen that in a lot of job descriptions. Um, they can use librarian to, to deal a lot more with like tech programming related things. Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. Um, so any other questions from anyone in the audience? I actually did have one um, question that came to mind as you were talking, Amanda. Um, yes. Have you have you taken part in any sort of professional development or any classes post graduation that have been particularly helpful to you? Oh, absolutely. And that's um, when I talked about the MLA earlier. That's actually what I really loved about the MLA is they have a lot of professional development classes that you can take. So I took a course in systematic reviews. Um, so systematic reviews are these very specific, highly curated literature searches. So if our doctors have a question about what is in the literature, we would do a systematic review. Um, the search strategy has to be really strong. It has to be peer reviewed. Everything has to be documented. You get authorship on these, they get published um, in journals. And pharmaceutical companies, so here's another thing, pharmaceutical companies will pay consulting agencies to do the systematic reviews. And I just think that's silly. I work here for a reason. I can do the systematic review. So I went ahead and took the class to learn how to do it um, on my own. Um, and it was a three-day course. It was probably one of the best courses I've ever taken. Like, I wish that San Jose State had something of that caliber. It was absolutely amazing. Um, from learning how to search PubMed better to how to devise my search strategies better, better documentation practices. And then of course, talking with other librarians about how they would approach it so you can see, you know, the different ways and, and the hows and the whys. I thought that was really oh, great. That's really great to know. Yeah. Cool, okay. Um, well, any, any uh, last burning questions? Okay. Um, well, it looks like we're going to end a little bit early, but thank you so much for your time, Amanda. This was so helpful to hear from you and really enlightening to, you know, give us a look into what one what it's like to work in one special library. Um, Adina, mm -hmm. Jack, thank you so much for your time. Lots of thank yous. Um, and before everyone leaves tonight, we would be very grateful if you could take a quick survey um, and an evaluation form that we're going to link in the chat. Um, and I'm also going to link to our newsletter in case you don't subscribe. Um, so let me just add that in really quickly. And I am going to add in my email. So if anybody has any questions awesome. at any time, please feel free to reach out. I absolutely love talking about special libraries and getting people hired. So if there's anything I can do, let me know. If you have any questions, let me know. That is awesome, Amanda. Thank you so much. So the link that I shared first is the survey link. Um, and then we have our program evaluation link here. Okay. All right, everyone, well, we'll stay on for just a couple more minutes, but um, if you have any questions, you know, we'll, we'll stick around otherwise. Thank you for coming, and we really appreciate you being in attendance tonight. Good night, everyone.